All right, we're going to sing some Christmas carols, so won't you stand to your feet with us and sing and celebrate the birth of our Savior in this Christmas season. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you came to earth, God, to make a way for us that we could be with you forever. We are so incredibly thankful for your life and your presence with us, God. May we celebrate you in this season, God, and not forget the true meaning of why you came here, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In your name, amen. Oh, come.
guys ready to worship this morning? Are we ready to sing? Celebrating the coming of Jesus this morning, yeah? Uh, let's just see you clap your hands just like this.
the stars are brightly shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long live the world in sin and ever pining till he appeared and the soul it's worth a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, oh, he. was born, oh divine, oh night, oh night divine. Sing again. Truly he taught us to love gospel is peace. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grace chorus praise we let all within us praise his holy name Christ is the Lord oh praise his name forever his power Heavens 
we praise your name in this place and we celebrate you today we thank you again for coming to be with us Emmanuel God with us forever for your sacrifice God we love you so much you're worthy of all the praise and it's in your name we say amen Well, welcome, whoa, sorry about that. Welcome to the last chapel of the semester. This, uh, this semester just flew by. I know many of you thought as it began that it was so far away to get to December, and it's already quiet week and finals week next week, and uh, you'll be headed back home for Christmas holidays here in just a few days. So I am so glad you're here. Thank you for being faithful throughout the semester to these chapel experiences on Mondays and gatherings on Tuesday night. Um, so thank you for being here this morning. The, the choir that opened up this, morn, or this morning is called Critical Mass. Uh, yeah, would you uh, tell them thank you for being here today? And then our worship band this morning had a little choir over here. Did you see that? That was kind of a new little addition. So thank the band as well for their faithfulness to us all year long. So this week we call Quiet Week. So you may notice that there won't be a whole lot of activities going on around campus. That's intentional. We want to give you some space to get ready for finals and finish your papers and everything else that is a part of uh, uh, this uh, time in the semester. So our speaker today is Tom Schrader. Tom is the uh, yeah, uh, is the founding pastor of e uh, founding pastor of East Valley Bible Church, which has now been called uh, the Redemption Church, and they have campuses all across the valley. And so Tom is one of our favorite speakers. So would you give him a big welcome this morning? Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Well, good morning. It is National Cookie Day. Yeah. Well, this is the this is the warm up. December fifteenth, National Cupcake Day. So it's only going to get better from here. It's uh, great to be on GCU campus. I was uh, at ASU uh, not long ago. And the difference between these two campuses is, is dramatic. Um, you, you, you walk onto that campus at ASU, and they're, they're like zombies walking around that place. And you walk on here, and there's a vibrancy. And the difference isn't the buildings, although it's kind of cool. The difference are the students. 
and, and, and you can feel it. So I was talking to a kid in, in, in a leadership class, which is amazing because he didn't have the ability to make eye contact. And I said to him, how would you end up at ASU? And he said, I couldn't get in GCU. So I thought that was perfect. It is really good to be here with you. I, Tim and I had breakfast, I don't know, in the spring. And he was laying out the chapel dates and said, I'd love to have you come, pick a date. And it took me two seconds to say, I want that last one. I, I, I knew it would be a Christmas time. Hearing those Christmas carols, it just it just jacks me up. It's just so cool and the memories, and I absolutely love it. And I knew also it would be kind of lining up with finals for you. So there's a little bit of tension in there as well. So I handpicked this uh, knowing those things. Uh, I brought a guest today. My daughter Haley is with me, and uh, it's great. Yeah, there you go. And then I brought... I brought another guest, and uh, it, it, it's an old buddy of mine, and I, I love the guy, uh, my, my buddy Elmo. And this Elmo uh, I bought uh, 12 years ago when Haley had uh, her first baby, and he was a boy. And I got Elmo, didn't know much about him and started to be intrigued with Elmo. Uh, he is a fascinating dude. Uh, he was first baby monster introduced in 1972. In 1985, he became Elmo. His birthday is February 3rd. He is two and a half years old and decided to be permanently two and a half years old. His BFF is Grover and Zoe. Uh, he has a pet, Dorothy the Goldfish. His favorite food is pizza. Gotta love that. His favorite color, I'll bet you could guess this one, red. The results of a recent survey discovered that he is as well-known as Santa Claus among children and more popular than his arch-rival Mickey Mouse. He became so popular that Sesame Street gave him a 15-minute segment every day. He starred in two feature films. One is Elmo Saves Christmas. It's a classic. Okay. Uh, he is the first Sesame Street character that was designed to reach kids three and under. He, he's appeared on talk shows, late night shows. Uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how this worked, but he's testified before Congress. He, he probably had to dumb it down for them. Um, he appeared in an... Yeah. Yeah, there was a little delay there. Uh, he appeared in an episode of West Wing. He represents 65% of all revenue stream to Sesame Street. All, all of that interesting background. When, when, when I got Elmo and Braden would play with him and then Braden would leave, and then I'd play with him. And, and, and I noticed something about Elmo. I, I notice that when you hit this flower, he speaks, and they're programmed, and I don't know, there's a dozen or so things that he says. But, but I was struck by the first two things that Elmo says. And, and I also know that those were not by accident. This uh, product is manufactured by Fisher Price. And Fisher Price started a Fisher Price laboratory where they tested products with kids. 
they never had a product test out higher than Elmo. An immediate reaction. So I'm going to try. Elmo is 34 years old. That's 85 in human years. So he's losing his zip. So I'm going to try. I'm going to turn him toward me. And, and I want to hit this. And I want you to hear what it says. Could you hear that? No. Well, you jerk. Okay. Well, he blew it because I can't redo it. He said, Elmo loves you. And then he says, Elmo loves you more. And I thought that was really odd. So I literally began to research this. And, and what happened is that when they took Elmo and Elmo said, Elmo loves you, these kids, and me, say goodbye to Elmo, he's done. Um, he, uh, he's cheap because I don't even have to feed him. Um, these kids immediately would throw their arms around him and, and they would talk to him and they'd smile and they'd laugh. But he, Elmo would say, Elmo loves you, and they would immediately say, we love you, Elmo. And Elmo would say, I love you more. There's a gentleman, and his name is Kevin Clash, and he was the voice and creator of Elmo. And Kevin said this of Elmo, Elmo connects with children and adults on the purest and most fundamental level. And this is the human desire to love and to be loved. Now, re re remember, Elmo is targeted at kids three and under. No really human experience yet. And yet there's this desire to love and be loved. And in, in, in this room, that's true of all of us. The, the challenge is we start to live life and Elmo loves you. So Elmo says, Elmo loves you. You say, I love you, Elmo. He says, I love you more. And, and we kind of have that conditional, unconditional Elmo love. But then we grow up and we realize that's not how the real world works. One author offers this insight. The most perfect human love cannot satisfy us. That's because our human hearts crave a relationship deeper and more lasting than anything possible in this world. We were made for God's love, and without it, we sink into loneliness, the darkness, the, the breakdown of human ties, the limitations and loss of human affection lead to that higher friendship, that larger and more permanent love. By now, you've lived long enough to understand that that human relationship that I love you. It's not perfect. You've now had the high school summer camp where you went away and we're going to be best friends forever and you buy a heart that's torn in two pieces and you have one and she kept the other one and, and, and you're, you're going to be best friends forever and you came to GCU, and you haven't talked to her since. Guys, you've had that. We're going to hang in there. We're going to be buddies. Maybe you've had the, the broken love of a, of a parent, of a friend. Uh, my wife Sandy and I have been married five and a half years. Uh, I was married to... Susan for 34 years, and Susan passed away, and uh, 
I met Sandy, and uh, we got married. And I'm, yeah, well, thanks. My pleasure. Uh, well, I, and I'm trying to make this like this really cool marriage. So I'm trying to talk to her. So we're at dinner one night. I know. Well, you'll get it when you get there. Uh, I'm at dinner one night, and I said to her, Sandy, I love you. And she said, why? And I said, oh, wow, this wasn't a discussion question. It was <laughs> just trying to tell you. And so I thought, all right, regroup. You're a pro. You can handle this. And, and don't go for because you're pretty, though she is. Go, you know, and I said, well, you know, you're, you're really smart. And she said, would you love me if I was stupid? I said, probably not. I, I, don't, think I, I don't think I'd be here with you if you were stupid. And, 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 I, and I thought, well, okay, regroup, you know, stay on this. Don't let this get away. And I said, you know, and, and you're, you're very pretty. She's very physically fit. I mean, she could bench press this building. She's just, just she's, she's a stud. And I said, well, you're very pretty and you're fit. And, and she said, would you love me if I wasn't pretty? No, that was a real, that was a test. But, but here's, here's the essence of that. And she captured it. When we say we love you, it's conditional. I'll love you if. I'll love you when. I'll love you because. It's Christmas time, and Max Licato offers this incredible insight. The story of Christmas is the story of, and I want you to see that next word, of God's relentless love of you. God says, I love you. And at some point, many of you in this room have said back, and God, I love you. And he says, I love you more. And it's not like an Elmo love or a BFF love or even a husband-wife love or a child-parent love. It's God's love. It's perfect love. You have this fundamental, deep human desire to be loved. And Elmo can't fill it, and your roommate can't fill it, and your future spouse, if you get married, can't fill it, and your parents can't, and a friend can't. Only God can. You know, I had already been thinking about this stuff when Tim said, pick a chapel date, and I said Christmas. And, and I want to take a very familiar verse and make it your Christmas verse. John 3.16. For God so, okay, do you see it? Loved the world. And, 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 and maybe that's too broad, and, and I don't want to mess around with Scripture, but for sake of really driving this home, maybe you put your name in there. Not in an egotistical way, because God drove it. For God so loved Tom that he gave his only begotten son that if Tom believes in him, I shall not perish. God loves you. And, and here you go. We've got 10 minutes and 20 seconds left. He, 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 let, let, let me drive this because I want you to see it. Because you might think, well, God love me, but, but sure, look at me. Why wouldn't he? No, big, big deal here. God loves you in spite of you, not because of you. I, I selected Romans 5, 8 
But it's in this little riff that Paul does where he says in Romans 5, 6, while we were still weak, God demonstrated his love for us and while we were yet sinners. While we were yet sinners and unworthy, God loved you. And, and what he did is he acted. That's what love does. Love is never passive. If you say you love someone, you'll show it. Sandy and I just had this conversation last night. If I say I love you, you ought to be able to see it. I see this all the time. I used to do a lot of marriage counseling, and, and I don't do much anymore. It's a lot of work. But you would inevitably hear most often a wife say, uh, he doesn't love me. And then the guy would go, oh, I love her. Huh? And, and I would say, he says he loves you. And she would say, he says he loves me, but he doesn't. What? Show it. We know it intuitively. That love is all about sacrifice. First John 3.16, For we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. That's how we understand his love. That's what love is all about. Love doesn't seek its own. We, we live in a time and a world and an environment that's all screwed up. This is a mess. And, and the solution, obviously, it's like when you're a little kid in Bible Sunday school, whenever anybody asks a question, you just say Jesus, and you're right 87% of the time. But, but the answer to this is Jesus. The answer to us in, in our inner interactions with one another is to not be worried about my pride and my ego. And what about me? I used to travel a lot, and I'd come home, and I'd always bring a gift for the girls. I have Haley and a daughter, Sarah. And inevitably, I'd get something simple, a T-shirt or something. I'd come in, one of the kids would come in, and I'd give them the T-shirt. And the other one, every time, would come down the hall and say, what about me? And, and we spend so much of our life saying, what about me? What about me? Love. And the answer to that is to say, I don't care for now about me, but what about you? You know, let me drive this to conclusion. Paul writes this in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wage of sin is death. Man, look how bald that is. Wow. I'm sorry. That's ugly right there. I never see that. Oh, my God. And then I look like a French poodle down here. Not good. The wage of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. The, the wage of being human is death. Death means separation, separation from God. There's an incredible line. I, I, Mary, don't you know, is like my favorite Christmas song. And there's a great, and there's a great line in there. The child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Deliver me from what? From the wage of sin. From, from, are we clapping for sin or delivery? <laughs> I hope it's delivery. The wage of sin is death. You're at Christmas, and this is gift time. But here's the greatest gift you can ever receive, not give. It's eternal life in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace 
you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is uh, Christmas time, gift of God. Here's what we discover, is that as we live, we see that things are a mess. The world's a mess. The country's a mess. The state's a mess. The county's a mess. The city's a mess. The campus is a mess. You're a mess. And, and that mess is sin. And that sin is separated from God. And there's a point in time. I cannot imagine that everyone in here has not by now experienced it. That there's a point in time where you realize it's a mess. And your flinch is to try to fix it, to make it better. That's called religion. God hates religion. He loves and thrives on a personal relationship with you. I'm saved from the wage of sin, which is death. I'm saved, not by my efforts, but by Christ and the cross. That's why at Christmas, it, it's, it's this kind of beautiful, peaceful time, but I can't separate Christmas from Easter. I can't separate Christ's birth from his death and resurrection. And it's in that death and resurrection that we have eternal life. And you have the ultimate picture of love. I want to go back to that quote by Max Licato. This is the story of Christmas. God's relentless love for you. Someone has described God as the hound of heaven. He's seeking after you. He's relentless. He will pursue and pursue and pursue, not to punish and destroy you, but because he loves you. There's no greater love than this, his love for you. Let me put a bow on it. We come into the world thirsty for love. And, and we're going to look all over for it. We're going to look to Elmo. We're going to look to other people. And I can guarantee you, every relationship you ever have, you'll be disappointed. There'll be some point in time where that person won't react the way you want them to. And that's because you're asking them to be God. No person can do that, but God can. In, in the midst of a dark, tough world, Jesus comes as the Prince of Peace. That doesn't mean the absence of turmoil. It's the presence of God within the hardship and joy and reality of life. That's the Christmas message. You're going to have a bunch of opportunities in the next few weeks to demonstrate love. You're going to have family dinners. You're going to be with old friends. And you need to understand this. You, we sang this line, God and sinner reconciled. As Christians, we have peace with God. Therefore, we have the peace of God. We have the peace of God to demonstrate to our world the fruit of the Spirit, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And he said, you've been reconciled to me. Now you take that ministry of reconciliation to the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that truth. Thank you for knowing us. You created us. 
and you know we need love and we desire it desperately and we'll search everywhere for it. And we understand that all of those false gods never fail to fail. They disappoint us every time. Because, God, we were designed to be loved by you. God, let us, let us understand that and live it, especially at this Christmas time. Father, we pray these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, have a great Christmas.